Hello and welcome to the Reviews Brothers, where we are going through the entire catalogue of games of the PS2 and picking 10 games for each letter that don't get talked about a whole lot. Now we are on the letter K, so how about I shut up, you press that subscribe button and we take a look at some games. We are starting with Khan Barbarian's Blade, a game originally released for the PC in 2002 and then got a port to the PS2 in 2004, thanks Wikipedia. Khan is a 3D action platform game where you are Khan, a cool cartoony barbarian man who is on a quest to stop an evil sorcerer from being a bastard. You know, standard barbarian stuff really. The sorcerer has some magic amulets that you want to get back, otherwise he'll be able to take over just about everything. And on top of that, the bastard has gone and kidnapped a princess, so you might as well get her back at the same time. I wonder if adventurers would still get the princesses back if they weren't always super sexy conveniently. Anyway, Khan's adventure takes him across a whole bunch of levels where you'll need to fight dangerous monsters, collect new weapons and armour, and even do some simple puzzle platforming. And it's all done pretty well. The levels are quite large, but also linear. You tend to have just one path to follow, but I don't really mind that. As you explore that one path, enemies will appear out of nowhere, but this is actually explained as it's the sorcerer teleporting them in to try and kill you. You get quite a small variety of enemies, and a lot of them are actually pretty tough. Most of the enemies are evil soldiers, and they do a pretty good job of attacking you and defending themselves. You'll also fight various little insect things, beast men, and even dastardly plants that want to eat you. Being a barbarian though, you are pretty good at attacking yourself. As in, you're good at attacking enemies, you don't attack yourself. That would be silly. You start with a sword, and this does some pretty decent damage. You've got a few combos, and you'll want to use these properly to break defences and do maximum damage. You also build up a power meter at the bottom of the screen that lets you do a few special attacks by hammering all the buttons at the same time. These are great against groups of enemies. And that's something that happens a lot. You'll find that you're fighting three or more enemies at the same time. And they have no issue rushing you and not doing the thing where one attacks you at a time. Here they all just gang up on you and kick your ass in no time. This can be frustrating, but you do have a block, which does only block in front of you, so you can be still stabbed in the back, and you have a dash move, which is more to get out of the way than to attack. You also pick up new weapons, like an axe you can throw, and an even bigger sword, which does more damage and has more combos. What's cool is that if you collect enough coins, which are scattered around the levels, as well as performing well enough in the level by completing it within a certain time, killing a certain percentage of enemies and so on, you get to enter a trial between levels. These are just arena battles where you've got to kill a certain number of enemies. If you kill them without losing your health, then you get an armour upgrade, extending your life bar. You only get one attempt though, so if you fail then you miss out and you won't be able to be fully powered up by the end of the game. The platforming here is quite fun as well. There's plenty of floating platforms and moving things that you need to get on, and the controls are actually very good, so it's never really an issue. You can use your axe to smash certain blocks, and you can even throw it like a boomerang, and you'll need to do this to create bridges and so on by smashing down pillars. There is a very light puzzle element to some of it, but it's nothing too complex. The graphics here are good, but nothing really special. I do like the cartoony style, and everything runs very smoothly, which is always a good thing in my book. It is quite a short game and can be beaten in about 4 hours, but it's definitely a fun time while you're doing it. Klonoa 2 Lunar T's Veil is the follow up to the popular PS1 game, but I rarely ever hear anyone talking about this one, and it's actually the first Klonoa game that I've ever played. You are Klonoa, a rabbit dog cat thing. You have a magic ring that lets you grab and throw things better than anyone else can grab and throw things. You're transported to a dream world which is becoming unbalanced by all the monsters that have started appearing, and the king of the dream world asks you to find the four bells that you need to ring to restore the balance. Or something like that. I'll be honest, the story really dragged on here and was pretty overly convoluted for a cute 2.5D platform game. Thankfully, the gameplay is really fun, and you can just skip the story. So the game takes place in a 2D plane, but it's all made up of polygons, so it does a really cool thing where the world twists and turns around you, and I've got to say, I really do enjoy 2.5D games. When they're done well, they look really cool, and this is a great example of that. Your main objective for pretty much every level is just to get to the end. Eventually you'll meet a boss character, and then you fight them and just get the bell back. You can run, jump and float with your big ears, but the main mechanic here is your ring, which you'll use to grab enemies. You can then carry them around with you, and can use them to throw at other enemies, killing them. Or you can throw them at switches to activate them, or various parts of the scenery to interact with it, usually as part of a puzzle. 
if you're carrying an enemy, you can also use their face as a platform to jump from, letting you do double jumps, which is cool. Being a 2.5D game, there are usually things in the background and foreground as well, and you'll sometimes need to throw things at these to progress. Working some of these things out is never too tricky, but it's always good plain fun. Enemies don't really put up much of a fight, and really they're actually just there as tools for you to be able to get around the level. It doesn't really matter if you mess up, as they constantly respawn, so you won't ever get stuck. Enemies tend to have different properties as well, so some let you jump higher, some let you fly, some even give you elemental powers. Combinations of these can be needed by the end of the game, so you might need to find an electric type enemy so you can smash through blocks, then find a helicopter one to fly over the tall obstacle next to you, and so on. But the ones you never need are never too far away. The bosses here are really cool and fun to fight, even if they are a little too easy. Their weak point is usually a big glowing thing, and pretty much all of them just need you to throw things into the screen and take place on a circular level. I really like the graphics here, each of the worlds are nice and colourful with loads of things going on and the character animations are great. The cutscenes look good, but even if they are it's very slow and have some really annoying voices, but again you can skip them and you're never left wondering what you need to do. There's a map screen and you can tell what levels you need to visit as they're all colour coded. So yeah, if you want a fun but quite easy little game that will last you a few hours, this is a good one to check out. Fighting game time now with King of Fighters Maximum Impact. Now I'm not very familiar with the King of Fighters series, being a Street Fighter person myself. My main introduction to them were the Capcom vs SNK games and even then I pretty much stuck with the Street Fighter characters. But over the years I have played a few of the series, mainly the 2D ones, and this one here is the first 3D one I played and I've got to say it's really damn fun. There is a story, but it's in Japanese, and also I don't think I've ever given a shit about a story in a fighting game, but from the seams of it, there is a tournament and you're part of it, so off you go to punch people in the nuts until they can't stand up anymore. You get a very generous roster of 20 characters, including a hidden one to choose from, most of which have their own moves and fighting styles, so you get the martial artists, the street brawlers, the wrestlers, the speedy ones that jump around a lot, and then of course there's my... I've tried about half the characters at this point, and I really do like how they control. Special moves are easy to pull off and each character has their own combos and super moves to learn. You've got the usual power bar at the bottom of the screen and the more this is filled up the better the special moves you can pull off are. One thing that I did find annoying here though is that you're forced to use the D-pad, which is fine as the PS2 D-pad is pretty good, but I would have rather used the analog stick. It's all one on one so there's no team ups or anything like that, and although the game is in 3D, it's pretty much always played on a 2D plane, though you can dodge left and right, but there's not a big emphasis on it, which I like. Pulling off combos is really satisfying, and often you can just hammer one button to do a basic one, making this easy to pick up and play, but for those willing to learn, there are a ton more you can do, and it's actually surprising how many attacks each character has. There's a couple of characters that share the same moves with slight variations, but for the most part everyone is their own thing and the differences between them are really noticeable, meaning that you'll definitely have your favourite characters here. There's also plenty of backgrounds, in fact it looks like each character has their own one, which I always appreciate. I didn't used to be that fussed about backgrounds in fighting games, especially ones that aren't interactive like here, but nowadays I do tend to notice if you're fighting on the same two or three over and over and having new ones really does help with the enjoyment, but it would have been nice if there was some interactivity here. And graphically, the game looks great, all the character models are very detailed with all the jiggle physics that you want, and the animation is super smooth, which really helps with the controls, which are spot on. And that's all I really need to say, this is just a very solid fighting game that's easy to pick up and play if you want a button mash, but has more than enough if you want to learn, if you want to sink a few hours into it. Over to Japan now for Kena, which I probably said wrong, which is a shame because I have to say it probably a few times here. This is an action game based on a French animated movie, and for some reason the game was never released outside of Japan, which is a shame, as it's actually pretty damn fun if you ask me. The plot's a funny one, it starts with aliens crash landing on a planet, and all the aliens are killed by the planet's natural predators. Fast forward 600 years, and a bunch of tree dwellers that don't ever leave their trees are attacked by some monsters, which Kaina, who always wanted to explore outside of the tree, sets off to see what's going on. It's not exactly groundbreaking, but I like it. The gameplay here is a lot like some of the early 3D action games like Alone in the Dark, or even classics like Time Commando. All the characters are 3D models, but the backgrounds are pre-rendered with fixed camera angles that switch when you get to certain points of the screen. So you start out in your tree world, where you have to explore all around and defeat the enemies that have made their way to you. 
These come in the form of various wildlife looking things like frogmen, dog things, bugs and so on. But there's also evil tribes people after you as well. You can defend yourself quite well though and you have a knife which has some pretty devastating combos making light work of most enemies. And as you progress you'll find new weapons like a crossbow and a bigger knife and even a gun thing. It's easy to know where you need to go thanks to a handy map that fills in the blanks as you go to new screens. You will need to find items and keys to progress so backtracking is needed but the worlds are never too large. There aren't many crazy puzzles here and most of the game is just exploring to find the key or item that you need and you'll need new weapons as some enemies can only be killed with certain weapons. The controls can take a minute to get used to, it's tank controls but they do work fine. You're also forced to use the d-pad which still works perfectly well but I don't see why they wouldn't let you use the analogue. You can lock onto enemies which is handy especially as some of them fly and it also means that if they go off the screen you still have an idea of where they are. You can also pull off your combos with ease and when you're in combat you can block and dodge in any direction. Hitting enemies with your dodge even does a little damage which is cool. What's nice is that the more you use a weapon the better you get with it and each weapon levels up separately offering bigger and better combos. You'll find health and items all over the levels and enemies even drop health when you kill them which is good. Bosses, which are really fun to fight, usually give you a new weapon as well. Something that really stands out here are the cutscenes, which are presumably taken directly from the movie, which I kind of want to watch now. I really love the designs of the characters and enemies, they're all a bit strange and they look great. The monsters especially are awesome. Also, as you play, you'll meet other characters that aren't trying to kill you. I've got no idea what they talk about, but they often give you little tasks to complete and you can help them out. This will give you new items as well. I don't think these things are compulsory, but even with the language barrier, it's easy to figure out what they want. And actually, this game doesn't suffer from not being in English. You can just imagine that you really are helping an alien race, and the way the cutscenes are done, even the in-game ones, really make it clear what you need to do, which I'd say is just kind of good game design. What's really cool is that the further into the game you get, you start to discover the alien ship that was crashed, and discover that maybe they weren't all killed after all. I really like how the game moves from a tribal setting to a sci-fi one with some nice enemies and some tech that you can start to use yourself. It's a real shame that this didn't get an English release, as I do think it would have done quite well. I've got no idea what the reviews were like for this one, it's definitely not a perfect game, some of the controls can be dodgy, but they are easy to get used to. The graphics are good though, and the atmosphere of everything really just kept me wanting to play. This is definitely one I recommend, and as mentioned, even though it's in Japanese, you won't have any trouble working out what you've got to do here. While we're over in Japan, we should check out Kujibuki Unbalanced, a game based on an anime, and be prepared to be shocked, because I have never seen or heard of it. What about you, Jake? At first, I thought this is actually going to be a visual novel, as the intro goes on for about 200 years, but after pressing skip for nearly 7 minutes, and that's not an exaggeration, I finally got to some actual gameplay. I don't know what the story was, but you're in a creepy school area, which is kind of like a castle thing, and you, as a punk kid, along with two anime girls who would probably get you arrested in most countries, have to explore these dungeon-like areas that are filled with various enemies ranging from creepy faceless people to evil fridges, skeletons, and even demons. Fighting them is easy, as you have a baseball bat which you can smash their faces in Negan style. You have a basic combo, but it does the job. You can lock onto enemies and strafe around them, but most aren't too tough and they give you loads of warning when they're about to attack. Your two anime girl chums will also fight enemies and run around doing their own thing. They don't do a great job of it and maybe they'll kill one enemy per room while you wipe out the other ten or so. You can also pick up pretty much anything in the level as well, so if you see bins or tables and chairs you can pick them up to throw them at enemies. These are especially handy against the flying ones. You get a map that fills in as you go so you know where you've been and where you need to go which is handy. And between levels you can visit a shop and spend the hundreds of diamonds that drop when you kill enemies. I don't know what a lot of the things in the shop were, but you can get upgrades for all your characters giving them more health and making their attacks stronger. You also get health items that you can carry around with you that need to be used manually. All items can be used for all the characters as well, so you need to make sure you keep an eye on their health and stats so you can survive in the later levels. So far I haven't found any new weapons, but they might just be hidden in a menu that I can't read the words for. The actual levels here don't get wildly different, other than a slight change of scenery. They do all basically play the same. Go through corridors, beat everything to death, a new door opens, repeat. If you go too far ahead of your lady friends, they'll get stuck in a room, or sometimes even the previous floor if you get too far ahead. But it's never really an issue as they'll eventually find their way to you, but they can still take damage as enemies will carry on attacking them, and it does mean that enemies will immediately focus on you as well. But still, your baseball bat is usually more than enough. 
The game looks good enough with your standard anime vibes. The cutscenes are all stills and they do drag on forever and a day. Granted I may have missed some stuff that you can do there, but I didn't have any issues actually playing the game when it got to the actual gameplay. And I don't really remember seeing any choices being made. But I did have fun playing this one, and even though it's quite basic and repetitive, it's got that just one more level quality of gameplay to it. Right, back to a game that we can understand, as long as you speak Australian that is. Here is KO the Kangaroo Round 2, the sequel to the first game, which I think was only released on the Sega Dreamcast. The story here is simple, KO and his mates are kidnapped by an evil hunter, who I believe is the bad guy in the first game. Luckily, he didn't bother to take away your boxing glove, as you know, you know, you're a kangaroo. So you can just break out of your cage, and then you set off to rescue all your mates over a bunch of levels. You'll need to guide KO through your usual bunch of 3D worlds, with jungles, ice levels, fire levels, cave levels, and of course swimming levels. These are all connected by a hub world as well, but thankfully getting around is easy, and you have access to all the levels by talking to most of the characters you meet in the hub world. I like this, and it means you don't have to do loads of backtracking just to get to a new stage. The levels themselves are all quite large, but actually quite linear. You won't need to do a ton of exploring, but what's here is still pretty fun. As you need to rescue your mates, you've got to keep an eye out for cages where they're all being held. When you find them, it's just a case of giving them a good slap and your mates will be free. They aren't particularly hidden or hard to get to, mostly just being your usual path. Also, you don't have to rescue everyone you see, unless you want a 100% completion that is. Most of the time it's just a case of getting to the end of the level and moving on, and then eventually you'll fight a boss. So really the main thing here is the platforming, which is done pretty well. The controls are super smooth and KO can run, jump, double jump, climb and attack. Most of this is done easily, but sadly the attacking leaves a lot to be desired. It works for the most part, but I find it really hard to not take damage thanks to some shoddy hit detection. As you probably guessed, you punched enemies to defeat them, but most of the time you take damage during your animations, and also seemingly when you're miles away from enemies, which can be very frustrating. Thankfully there's quite a few health power-ups, and you can even get boomerangs to throw. These are much better, but you do have a limited supply. The platforming though is great fun, and it has a fair bit of variety. The levels, even though they're fairly standard fare, do mix things up a bit, and you'll be surfing, driving vehicles, riding minecarts, and all sorts on your adventure. And as with most 3D platform games, it looks pretty good. I am a big fan of these cartoony graphics, and these ones are good. The levels all look great, and the animations are decent. There's plenty of things to collect in the levels as well. These unlock doors in the hub world, giving you access to a bunch of mini-games and challenges to complete. I didn't really bother with too many of these, but they can be a nice distraction. Overall, this is a fun 3D platform game. It's never going to be the best game you've ever played, but it's fun for what it is, and it's well made enough, and it might be worth taking a look if you like these games like I do. Knights of the Temple Infernal Crusade is a game that I've actually owned on the GameCube for years, but ironically I'm now playing it for the first time here on the PS2. You play as Paul, a Templar Knight on your first crusade trying to stop the end of the world from the bunch of bastards. You start off looking for a bishop only to uncover a deadly conspiracy where they're trying to use the powers of a sexy woman called Adele who can be used to open a portal to hell, which to be honest is not the story I was expecting. You do all of this in an exciting 3D adventure that's pretty much made up of chopping people with various swords and solving simple puzzles. It is mostly combat here, so you'll be taking on a whole army of possessed monks, knights, bandits, and eventually even some demons. Your adventure takes you through holy monasteries, cities, catacombs, deserts, and yep, even some hellscapes. As the combat is the main focus here, you get a few weapons and combos. These are all easy to use, and your weapons do feel like they have a weight behind them. There's usually a few enemies coming at you at once, and they're surprisingly good at looking after themselves. You will definitely need to get used to blocking, as well as using the various moves that you unlock as you play. You'll learn moves that break attacks or stagger enemies, and these are vital when you're fighting three or four at the same time. Animations can take a while to play out, and you have to wait for them to finish before being able to do anything else, including block. So timing is everything here. I do wish there was a dodge button though, as it is easy to get stuck in a corner and attacked by a few enemies. Thankfully, your block blocks everything, no matter where they are. What's cool is that as you progress, you get more and more armour, and you start to look like a badass by the end of the game, fully kitted up. You even learn a few magic spells to help you out. In fact, this is kind of like a serious version of that Khan Barbarian game we looked at before. Enemies will drop health and keys that you'll need, and you'll often get locked in a room and have to solve simple puzzles. These mostly involve pushing blocks or switches, or finding combinations to match icons and that sort of thing. 
They're never particularly complex, but they do help break up the mindless sword swinging. There is a fair bit of story here, which I have to say I actually found quite interesting. I was a bit worried that I was going to be a preachy religious affair, but thankfully it was all about monsters and conspiracies, which I am okay with. The graphics here are good, they do go for realism which means it can look a little wonky at times, but overall the detail is decent and I have to say a lot of it is very dark, and I mean the kind of dark where you just can't see what's going on. Most indoor areas are like this, with candles lighting the way, and the cave and catacomb levels have parts where I really struggle to see where the hell I needed to go. It doesn't help that it's mainly a fixed camera, and this is really my main complaint, as otherwise I did enjoy playing this game. There's even a sequel for it, which, to be honest, kind of surprised me. So I think I may even go back and finish this one and give that a go, and I would say that you should too. This is definitely a game that no one ever talks about. Connecticut is a cool futuristic racing game featuring a bunch of freaky future people who are sort of attached to their bikes and have to take part in a bunch of future races. You know the sort. You get to choose from a decent selection of races, each with their own stats, and then you choose from single races, tournaments, time trials, or a two-player mode. The racing action is pretty simple, but also very fun. The tracks are your usual future fairs with big neo cities, spaceports, and apocalyptic wasteland looking places. What's cool is that the tracks have crazy amounts of bends, jumps and zero gravity sections so you spend as much time racing on the ceiling as you do the floor. As it's a racing game, there's weapons here too. You find crystals on the track which you can collect, but you need to get 5 or more of them before you get a weapon, which is a bit annoying but manageable. The weapons are things like EMP pulses or electric shocks which stun opponents. But you also get boosts and a thing that enables slipstream, and you can also get a boost from driving behind the other racers. Completing the cup mode unlocks new characters and more tracks to race on, which is always good. The action is fast and frantic. You're also encouraged to do tricks when you go off of ramps. These will fill your boost meter and you're going to need it. The computer AI is pretty good, but not impossible. You'll need to get used to some of the tracks if you want to win every time, but even on my first try I was able to be in the top 3 quite consistently. The controls here will take a bit of getting used to. It is kind of standard controls, but they're quite slippery, and it feels like your character goes all over the place a lot of the time. But that's because you really need to use the brake and drift buttons when going around corners. Once you're used to doing that, you'll be able to speed around the place. Also, each character really does control quite differently, so try them all to see which one suits you best. There's a few massive characters which are great on the shorter tracks and can just bash everyone out of the way, but on the longer, more windy tracks you want a faster, more nimble character, but they're all quite well balanced. I did find that sometimes when I was racing I'd get stuck on the scenery, or when coming off a jump I would glitch through a wall. Thankfully you get reset back onto the track and I never lost too many positions and was able to catch up. Usually it was more amusing than annoying. I do really like the graphics here, the bike designs are great and the variety in the tracks are really good, with a great draw distance. If you like fast future races then this is a great one to play, it's like a cross between Wipeout and Extreme G and I'm a fan of both those series so playing this was right up my alley. Survival Horror time now with Quan. This is a really cool game made by From Software and you can really see this in its presentation and graphics. The story goes that a few characters, which you get to choose from, arrive at a manor that has been overrun with demons and monsters, so you need to stop them. There is more to it than that, but that's the gist. There's two characters to choose from, Utsuki and Sakuya. Utsuki's father is one of the monster hunters sent to clean out the manor, and you're there looking after your sister, who then gets possessed and goes missing while you're waiting outside for your dad to come back. So you have to go into the manor, find your dad, and help to get him out. Thankfully, you have been taught some skills, so you're able to deal with some of the monsters and demons that come your way. If you play as Sakuya, you're one of the team of monster hunters that's been sent to cleanse the manor, and her story revolves around getting rid of all the monsters. The two characters play quite differently from one another, with Utsuki being more of a melee character and Sakuya being more magic based. Now, both of them can use the melee and magic, but they definitely have preferred styles. The actual gameplay and world is pretty much the same for both, with the same locations being explored, but they have different starting locations and will meet different characters along the way with slightly different paths and puzzles. The actual gameplay is what you'd expect from a survival horror, but I don't mean that in a bad way. You explore a creepy world that's filled with monsters and locked doors, and you need to find various items to open new rooms to explore new areas while fighting off the demons. Monsters come in a few flavours, you get your standard demons as well as swamp demons, slug things and even creepy ghosts that will chase you. 
All of the monsters will actually affect your sanity, so once you've fought them off or run away, you'll need to take a few minutes to meditate and clear your mind. The more scared you are, the blurrier the screen gets, making it hard to find items to see where you need to go, and also, if you're too scared, you end up getting vertigo, which makes you unable to use certain magic spells and attacks. The spells here are really cool. You get animals that you can summon, like spiders and wolves, which will follow you around and protect you as much as they can, but they can also get attacked by enemies, so you've got to work together with them and not rely on them. You also get direct attacks, like fire arrows that aren't too powerful, but do come in handy in a fight. You get a few melee weapons, and these are easy to use just with the press of a button, and you can assign two different attacks at once, one to the square button and one to triangle, so you can have a mix of melee and magic at the press of a button. But the magic spells do have limited use, and you need to find scrolls with more of them as you play. Something that the game does really well is the creepy atmosphere. It's set in ancient Japan, so it has suitably creepy ghosts, which I think the setting does so well. The ghosts look strange and contorted and will appear out of nowhere. Some won't attack you and are just there to make you shit yourself. And I do have to admit, the game did make me jump more than once. My only real complaint is that, again, the game is so damn dark that most of the time I just had trouble trying to see where the hell I needed to go. But once I'd bumped the brightness up on my TV a bit, I had an absolute blast. I love survival horror games and I really enjoyed this one. The fact that you don't often have to worry about ammo really helps, but doesn't mean you don't feel like you're not in danger, even when there's just one enemy. So yeah, if you like survival horror games, go play this one. And finally for today, here is Kaya Dark Lineage, and shout out to Jur the Orc, who also suggested I should include it on the list. You are Kaya, and your dad went missing a while ago. You and your brother Frank go and start looking through his stuff, and manage to open a portal to a new world filled with furry creatures that are being overrun by evil Welcome wolves and enslaved by a git of a sorcerer. Potential spoiler Decide alert now, but not really, as this is stuff you learn on the first level. But it turns out that your dad has of course been teleported to this land, and in what is actually a cool plot twist, it turns out that he is the evil sorcerer enslaving the natives, who are actually called natives, and turning them into the evil wolfen. You are given the task of transforming the Wolfen back into natives and eventually taking down your evil father. Now, I haven't beaten the game yet, but I think we can all guess what will happen at the end, and I suspect it will be a happy one. So yeah, once the native leader, who I'm sure is voiced by the same guy that does Master Roshi, gives you your orders, you've got to explore a large hub world which gives you access to all the levels as well as various shops and other places to visit. Each level you visit requires you to turn back all the Wolfen into natives. To do this, you fight them, and the combat here is pretty fun. You've got a ton of combos that you can perform, and as you play, you can buy more combat bracelets, which give you access to more moves. Once you've pummeled a wolf enough, you can turn them back, provided you have enough green orbs, which are sort of like your ability power currency. You can use these orbs for loads of things in the game, like healing, fighting, transforming, unlocking teleports, and so on. You know when you'll need to use them, as you can see a number appear on whatever it is you're trying to interact with, and it tells you how many you need to interact with it. Thankfully, these green orbs are all over the place, and they do respawn if you leave and return to an area. So far, I've never not had enough. Something I really like here is that there's a bigger emphasis on falling with style. There's cannons and air currents all over the place, and these will send you flying into the air, and you've got to navigate through some tricky areas filled with obstacles and spikes. There's even cool bits where the air is pushing you up against a wall, but rather than just getting squashed and dying, you can use the air current to climb and walk up the walls, thanks to physics, if you know what I mean. Between levels, you'll want to visit the shops to spend the money that you find. Welcome. Here you can buy loads of cool stuff that you'll need to progress, like climbing gloves, new weapons, and because it's the 2000s, snowboards. What's cool is that the village grows as you rescue the natives, and this is how you open new levels and shops, as they're constantly building and upgrading, and when you're in the hub world, you can see the progress that they're making. The levels are pretty large here, and will take a few hours to get through each one. You will need to come back to old levels with new abilities as well, which is something I always like in games like this, and I have to say, this game really does feel unique. Couple that with some great cartoony graphics and some really excellent looking levels, as well as decent controls and original mechanics, and you really do have a game that deserves a lot more attention than it gets. Again, this is a game that I've never heard anyone talk about, but since playing it for this video, I've already gone back to play it to finish it. This is definitely one I plan on finishing, and it might even be my favourite one in this video. So there you go, 10 games for the PS2 starting with the letter K that don't get talked about all that often. 
Thank you as always for your suggestions, they really do help me to make these videos, so keep them coming. And now, all that's left for me to say is thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time.